I'm a restaurant manager. I run a small Japanese traditional sushi bar in Columbia, South Carolina. And if you ever came to apply for a job with me, great. I would sit you down, look you in the eye, and I would ask for you to describe to me in detail how you brush your teeth. <laughs> what a bizarre job interview question. Why would I ask about your toothbrushing? Well, it's actually a very practical question, and there's not a trick to it at all. I will often explain my reasoning as I'm talking to you. When people come to apply for a job as a cook, I need to hear from them how they would work in my workplace, even if they have never worked in my workplace before. And I need them to tell me that in a natural way. So if you're working at a restaurant, you need to have uh, take some ownership of your station. Are your tools clean and easy to reach? Do you work mindfully? If you come across some problem, can you adjust what you do so that you can do it even better the next time? Do you work well as a team? Are you able to share your space and accomplish our goals together with the team? And a lot of that gets mirrored in brushing your teeth. You have to have your sink well arranged. Your toothbrush and toothpaste have to be within easy reach. Uh, you have to, this is part of a larger morning routine, so you have to, how do you transition into it? How do you transition out of it? And how do you consider the family and the roommates that you have who also have to use the space in the same hectic morning hour? So I have no doubt that the way you tell me how you brush your teeth is how you approach some of your work. Plus, it's a funny job question to ask in an interview. And uh, it's hard not to acknowledge the silly situation that put us both in uh, when I ask it. So here we are on the TEDx stage. We're supposed to talk about big, interesting ideas, right? And we're supposed to talk about solving the world, right? OK, let's do it. Let's solve the problems in the world. So when we think about how to solve the problems in the world, we think about certain types of people. We think of millionaires, and we think of billionaires. We think of powerful leaders. We think of large corporations. And we think of massively creative people who are total 100% Einsteins. Uh, those people are useful, yes. But that's not really who I like to put together when I'm putting together a team. Um, so if I can just take a poll in the audience real quick. Who here is not a billionaire? <laughs> OK, we've got, OK. <laughs> who here is not a 100% Einstein? OK. So that's perfect. That's great. Because I think that. I had this suspicion when I came here that people like you and people like me, that we outnumber the billionaire Einsteins in the world. And so when we solve a problem, I like to f craft projects that are not for billionaires, but maybe for thousand heirs or hundred heirs. <laughs> and I know we do have a smart audience here. It's a university related event. Um, so I would put a solid at maybe like a 23% Einstein. It's pretty good. <laughs> And as far as creativity goes, I actually don't know the difference between people who are like intrinsically creative, creative in their soul. I don't know the difference between that and what I do, which is I have a few creativity-inducing techniques that I apply and layer on as the situation sees fit. And if it's OK with you, I'd like to share with you uh, two of my creativity-inducing techniques as we solve the problems of the world today. OK, so technique number one, look at the problem from literally any other perspective and try on a few of those. So one thing that creative people can do is they're able to jump out of these deep grooves in our lives of, of habits and thoughts. And you know these grooves really well. They are they're, they're the way you brush your teeth every morning. They are the one path you take every day to work. They are the way Google has learned to sort your search results. They are the one or two friends you go to when you're facing problems in life or work. They're really useful. And we've learned we can trust them over time. These are our perspectives. And these are what builds our perspectives. You may know that there are other options out there. And it takes a little bit of difficulty to jump out of those grooves and to jump into another perspective and take a look at the world. But it's worth doing that sometimes. So what you want to do is you want to take your issue and pull it up out of your life, turn it a little, and see it from a different angle. Is there another character in this story 
How would they solve my problem if they were in my place? Is there anything that I would agree with with that character? Or you could go sillier with this concept, and you could say, okay, I have a problem. How would my cat solve this problem? And the answers you come up with, it's going to be a whole list of probably mostly nonsense, but there's usually one or two uh, places where you can start and to start a new kind of form of thinking. Uh, I had a problem once, and you have uh, also probably had this problem. I think of the best ideas when I am in the shower. I always remember the most important things, and I can never, if I were anywhere else, I could jot it down in my uh, TEDx uh, playbill notebook, but I can't. I'm in, the, I'm in the shower, and I always forget by the time it's over, it's the worst. So I was uh, at a friend's house, and I was with their kids, and I thought, okay, how would this four-year-old solve this problem? She would probably, I don't know, use her toys. And it turns out that there's a great toy that um, it's like a drawing pad, and you use magnets instead of pen and ink, pen and paper, you might know it. It's great. It's great inspiration. Um, so uh, that Christmas, I asked, for my, I asked my brother for a magnet doodle for Christmas, and we got some suction cup hooks and mounted it in the bathroom, and I've been using it every day to a hilarious success. Uh, who here likes pedestrian crosswalks? Okay, I think I like the idea of pedestrian crosswalks, but uh, they end up being quite stressful because, um, well, I, I was once hit by a car. I was walking through an intersection. I was in the crosswalk. I was on a, my green light, and I still got hit. It's a lousy experience. I don't recommend it. Don't ever do it. <laughs> so thinking about that, and uh, in this town, we have a weekly newspaper, and they have an anonymous complaint page, and it basically functions as a print Twitter. The, um, the, in it, the, a lot of times, pedestrians complain about drivers. Drivers complain about pedestrians. Drivers complain about other drivers. And the issue seems to be that we all need to learn the rules in, better. But even if we ourselves know the rules, there's no guarantee that the other uh, pedestrians or bikers or drivers know enough to protect us from harm. And I wanted to take, to take that on. I started to, uh, so when I cross the street now, I want to be a little bit more visible to cars. I want to remind the driver that they are a person, and I am a person, and we're trying to do something good here in a pedestrian crosswalk. We should be celebrating this moment <laughs> rather than all be annoyed by it. So what I do is I, I keep folded in my back pocket, I keep a piece of paper that's a sign that just says, thank you, and I show it to the cars as I walk across the street. <laughs> the, and I have a few versions of this sign. Some of them say, uh, thanks neighbor, or praise hands emoji, <laughs> or this. <laughs> so we've solved, we've solved job applications, we've solved shower thoughts, we've solved pedestrian crosswalks. Uh, let's, uh, let's do our second tactic, which is to purposefully mess around with the definitions of words. And now that we've solved a few problems, we can take a small break and talk about donuts, which uh, I think you're going to love this. I'm going to take donuts, which are a very beautiful thing, and I'm going to turn them into a math problem, which is also a very beautiful type of thing. Aren't you very excited? <laughs> OK, so I've, there's this phrase, baker's dozen donuts. And we know that that means 13 donuts. And we know that, so let's take a closer look at this phrase. We know that donuts are beautiful. We know that a dozen is 12. But how exactly does the word bakers modify dozen and donuts? And the way I see it, there's three possibilities. Uh, one definition, let's see, is that here? One definition is it can mean one extra. So you have a dozen donuts, you get one extra, 13 donuts. Second definition, and here's the math, is 13 twelfths of. So you take a dozen donuts, you add one twelfth of one dozen, a donut, and you get 13 donuts. Third definition is plus one donut. So you get a dozen donuts plus one donut, 13 donuts. That's great. So the way you figure out the nuance between these three definitions is you put the word bakers in different contexts. So let's ask ourselves, what would we get if we ordered a baker's one donut? So uh, one donut, first definition, one extra. One donut plus one extra, two donuts. Second definition, a donut plus a twelfth of a donut. So a little bit of a donut, or a donut hole, maybe. The third definition, one plus donut. So one donut plus a donut, two donuts. It's similar to this first one here. 
And let's take one more crack at it and put it in a little bit of weirder, weirder context and say, what would you get if you ordered a baker's cup of coffee? Right? So a baker's cup of coffee, first definition. One cup of coffee plus one extra, you get two cups of coffee. Second definition, a cup of coffee plus a twelfth of a cup of coffee, so a little, little splash of coffee. Third definition, a cup of coffee plus a donut. <laughs> Delicious. Yeah, I like it. So what, you know, this is just a little bit of word math, but it turns out that we have a lot of expectations and sort of intrinsic ideas about what a word means, and we don't even know how other people are hearing that same word that we use. And they may be hearing it in a little bit of a different way. And this example is also fun because we learn a little bit about what we think the personality of a baker is. So with the first definition, if we think of a baker as somebody who adds an extra to everything, we think of the baker as being a very generous person. If we think of a baker as somebody who can use the little bits of material and create something new out of it, we think of the baker as being a very resourceful person. And if we think about a baker as somebody who adds a donut to everything they do in their lives, that person is a very passionate person about donuts. So that's our donut break. Um, we, uh, we can move on to solving another world problem. How about it? Um, let's, do, let's solve influenza, the flu. So how do we solve the flu? Well, you know, simple, you could get a flu shot, of course. The flu shot is great. It protects you from a portion of the flu for a whole year. They cost from zero to $20 if you're a good shopper. Uh, if you... You know, if you get a flu shot every year for 10 years and you end up getting sick every year except one, if you get sick nine years in a row and on the 10th year it works, it prevents you from getting the flu, you don't miss some work, it ends up being worth it. The cost ends up being worth it. And uh, this is especially true if you are a wage-employed 100 air or 1,000 air. Uh, and you get to protect like any babies and grandmas you come across as you go about your day. Uh, so if... We do that, that's a level one solution. I want to take a look at words, I like words, so I think about flu shots, and I also think about this phrase, buy your friends a round of shots. <laughs> okay, there's something interesting here. There's something we can think about. So what would we do if we bought a friend a round of shots? Let's think about our, um, if we think about how we spend our November through February, which is a very popular time for the flu, we can think about three people in our lives, coworkers or friends or family, and Imagine if they were vaccinated, so they would be protected from a portion of the flu. And you would now have a percent chance of their percent chance of getting sick. So they're protecting you instead of you worrying about them getting you sick. Uh, and they also get to protect their babies and their grandmas, so it's great. Uh, so this is the kind of solution that I like to do. I like to add small, repeatable habits that I can that I can do over and over again that involves a little bit of creativity. None of these ideas uh, came fully formed. A lot of times they, took, they went through a process of, of refinement. And I'll take you through my process of refinement. What we do is we uh, have our idea, and then we get some community input in and uh, try to take out some of the friction so that it's more doable. And then we add a little bit of humanity so that it gets to the, we can do it like a single effective prick to the human heart of the challenge. And the way I've expressed my refinement process is through a print product that I created. Uh, I created with my friend, my designer friend, Josh Rainwater, and it's called Subpar Magazine, uh, which is, isn't that a great title? Don't you love that title? <laughs> subpar. Do you know what the word subpar means? We're doing words still. <laughs> subpar. That's right, you're right, it means lower than par. And we know that par is a great score in golf. So if you get a score in golf that's lower than par, you've got a subpar score, and that score is awesome. So if you come across a product called Subpar Magazine, you know, obviously, <laughs> that this magazine is about things that are awesome. So, so Subpar Magazine is just a short, short product, it's only six pages long. And each page represents a step in my refinement process for ideas. And you're welcome to use these as you are working on your own projects, as you think of like an amazing world-changing project for 1,000 air, 23% Einsteins. The page one of the magazine is we isolate a problem in the community. Page two, we lay out our intentions and come up with a project. Page three, 
we form a team of effective local people who will take on the project. Page four, we, docu we re document the progress. And page five, we report the results. And page six, we solicit feedback from the community. And that helps us refine, us, refine the process so we can go through it again in the future. So I think that while, while we come together and we solve our problems, we can all do this. We all have the ability to do a 1,000 air, 23% Einstein project. And when we look at this, we need to uh, make sure that we have a few principles in our, in our discipline. We need to make sure we take some ownership of our space. We make sure we love our tools. We make sure to think in terms of improvement. We want to care for the other people in the situation and make sure that we're all working together for the same goals. We have to unlock the secret meaning of brushing our teeth. Thank you. <laughs>